Chapter 82 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, BC. Tales of Laughter by Laura Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggum. The Greedy Cat once on a time there was a man who had a cat and she was so awfully big and such a beast to eat he couldn't keep her any longer so she was to go down to the river with a stone round her neck but before she started she was to have a meal of meat so the goody set before her a bowl of porridge and a little trough of fat that the creature crammed into her and ran off and jumped through the window outside stood the goodman by the barn door threshing good day goodman said the cat good day pussy said the goodman have you had any food to-day oh i've had a little but i'm most fasting said the cat it was only a bowl of porridge and a trough of fat and now i th think of it i'll take you too and so she took the goodman and gobbled him up when she had done that she went into the byre and there sat the goody milking good day goody said the cat good day pussy said the goody are you here and have you eaten up your food yet oh i've eaten a little to-day but i'm most fasting said the pussy it was only a bowl of porridge and a trough of fat and the goodman and now i think of it i'll take you too and so she took the goody and gobbled her up good day you cow at the manger said the cat to daisy the cow good day pussy said the bell cow have you had any food to-day oh i've had a little but i'm most fasting said the cat i've only had a bowl of porridge and a trough of fat and the goodman and the goody and now i think of it i'll take you too and so she took the cow and gobbled her up then off she set into the home field and there stood a man picking up leaves good day you leaf picker in the field said the cat good day pussy have you had anything to eat to-day said the leaf picker oh i've had a little but i'm most fasting said the cat it was only a bowl of porridge and a trough of fat and the goodman and the goody and daisy the cow and now i think of it i'll take you too so she took the leaf picker and gobbled him up then she came to a heap of stones and there stood a stoat and peeped out good day mr stoat of stone heap said the cat good day mrs pussy have you had anything to eat to-day oh i've had a little but i'm most fasting said the cat it was only a bowl of porridge and a trough of fat and the goodman and the goody and the cow and the leaf picker and now i think of it i'll take you too so she took the stoat and gobbled him up when she had gone a bit further she came to a hazel break and there sat a squirrel gathering nuts good day sir squirrel of the break said the cat good day mrs pussy have you had anything to eat to-day oh i've had a little but i'm most fasting said the cat it was only a bowl of porridge and a trough of fat and the goodman and the goody and the cow and the leaf picker and the stoat and now i think of it i'll take you too so she took the squirrel and gobbled him up when she had gone a little farther she saw reynard the fox who was prowling about by the woodside good day reynard slyboots 
said the cat. Good day, Mrs. Pussy. Have you had anything to eat today? Oh, I've had a little, but I'm most fasting, said the cat. It was only a bowl of porridge and a trough of fat, and the goodman and the goody and the cow and the leaf picker and the stout and the squirrel. And now I think of it, I'll take you too. So she took Reynard and gobbled him up. When she had gone a little farther, she met Long Ears, the hare. Good day, Mr. Hopper, the hare, said the cat. Good day, Mrs. Pussy. Have you had anything to eat today? Oh, I've had a little, but I'm most fasting, said the cat. It was only a bowl of porridge and a trough of fat, and the goodman and the goody, and the cow and the leaf picker, and the stout and the squirrel, and the fox. And now I think of it, I'll take you too. So she took the hare and gobbled him up. When she had gone a bit farther, she met a wolf. Good day, you greedy gray legs, said the cat. Good day, Mrs. Pussy. Have you had anything to eat today? Oh, I've had a little, but I'm most fasting, said the cat. It was only a bowl of porridge and a trough of fat, and the goodman and the goody and the cow and the leaf picker and the stoat and the squirrel and the fox and the hare and now i think of it i may as well take you too so she took and gobbled up gray legs too so she went on into the wood and when she had gone far and farther than far o'er hill and dale she met a bear cub good day you bear breeched bear said the cat good day mrs pussy said the bear cub have you had anything to eat today oh i've had a little but i'm most fasting said the cat it was only a bowl of porridge and a trough of fat and the goodman and the goody and the cow and the leaf picker and the stout and the squirrel and the fox and the hare and the wolf and now i think of it i may as well take you too and so she took the bear cub and gobbled him up when the cat had gone a bit farther she met a she-bear who was tearing away at a stump till the splinters flew so angry was she at having lost her cub good day you mrs bruin said the cat good day mrs pussy have you had anything to eat today oh i've had a little but i'm most fasting said the cat it was only a bowl of porridge and a trough of fat and the goodman and the goody and the cow and the leaf picker and the stoat and the squirrel and the fox and the hare and the wolf and the bear cub and now i think of it i'll take you too and so she took mrs bruin and gobbled her up too when the cat got still farther on she met baron bruin himself good day you baron bruin said the cat good day mrs pussy said bruin have you had anything to eat today oh i've had a little but i'm most fasting said the cat it was only a bowl of porridge and a trough of fat and the goodman and the goody and the cow and the leaf picker and the stoat and the squirrel and the fox and the hare and the wolf and the bear cub and the she bear and now i think of it i'll take you too and so she took bruin and ate him up too so the cat went on and on and farther than far till she came to the abodes of men again and there she met a bridal train on the road good day you bridal train on the king's highway said she good day mrs pussy have you had anything to eat today oh i've had a little but i'm most fasting said the cat 
it was only a bowl of porridge and a trough of fat and the goodman and the goody and the cow and the leaf picker and the stoat and the squirrel and the fox and the hare and the wolf and the bear cub and the she-bear and the he-bear and now i think of it i'll take you too and so she rushed at them and gobbled up both the bride and the bridegroom and the whole train with the cook and the fiddler and the horses and all when she had gone still farther she came to a church and there she met a funeral good day you funeral train said she good day mrs pussy have you had anything to eat to-day oh i've had a little but i'm most fasting said the cat it was only a bowl of porridge and a trough of fat and the goodman and the goody and the cow and the leaf picker and the stoat and the squirrel and the fox and the hare and the wolf and the bear cub and the she bear and the he bear and the bride and bridegroom and the whole train and now i don't mind if i take you too and so she fell on the funeral train and gobbled up both the body and the bearers now when the cat had got the body in her she was taken up to the sky and when she had gone a long long way she met the moon good day mrs moon said the cat good day mrs pussy have you had anything to eat to-day oh i've had a little but i'm most fasting said the cat it was only a bowl of porridge and a trough of fat and the goodman and the goody and the cow and the leaf picker and the stoat and the squirrel and the fox and the hare and the wolf and the bear cub and the she bear and the he bear and the bride and the bridegroom and the whole train and the funeral train and now i think of it i don't mind if i take you too and so she seized hold of the moon and gobbled her up both new and full so the cat went a long way still and then she met the sun good day you sun in heaven good day mrs pussy said the sun have you had anything to eat to-day oh i've had a little but i'm most fasting said the cat it was only a bowl of porridge and a trough of fat and the goodman and the goody and the cow and the leaf picker and the stoat and the squirrel and the fox and the hare and the wolf and the bear cub and the she bear and the he bear and the bride and bridegroom and the whole train and the funeral train and the moon and now i think of it i don't mind if i take you too and so she rushed at the sun in heaven and gobbled him up so the cat went far and farther than far till she came to a bridge and on it she met a big billy goat good day you billy goat on broad bridge said the cat good day mrs pussy have you had anything to eat to-day said the billy goat oh i've had a little but i'm most fasting i've only had a bowl of porridge and a trough of fat and the goodman and the goody in the byre and daisy the cow at the manger and the leaf picker in the home field and mr stout of stone heap and sir squirrel of the brake and reynard slyboots and mr hopper the hare and greedy graylegs the wolf and bear breech the bear cub and mrs bruin and baron bruin and a bridal train on the king's highway and a funeral at the church and lady moon in the sky and lord sun in heaven and now i think of it i'll take you too that we'll fight about said the billy goat and butted at the cat till she fell right over the bridge into the river and there she burst so they all crept out one after the other 
and went about their business and were just as good as ever all that the cat had gobbled up the goodman of the house and the goody in the byre and daisy the cow at the manger and the leaf picker in the home field and mr stout of stone heap and sir squirrel of the brake and renard slyboots and mr hopper the hare and greedy graylegs the wolf and bear breech the bear cub and mrs bruin and baron bruin and the bridal train on the highway and the funeral train at the church and lady moon in the sky and lord sun in heaven End of chapter 82 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 83 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Well done, ill paid. Once upon a time there was a man who had to drive his sledge to the wood for fuel, and a bear met him on the way. Hand over your horse, growled the bear, or I'll kill all your sheep by summer oh heaven help me said the man there's not a stick of firewood in the house you must let me drive home a load of fuel else we shall be frozen to death i'll bring the horse to you to-morrow morning yes on these terms he might drive the wood home that was a bargain but bruin said if he didn't come back he should lose all his sheep by summer so the man got the wood on the sledge and rattled homeward but he wasn't over pleased with his bargain you might fancy so just then a fox met him why what's the matter said the fox why are you so down in the mouth oh if you want to know said the man i met a bear up yonder in the wood and i had to give my word to him to bring dobbin back to-morrow at this very hour for if he didn't get him he said he would tear all my sheep to death by summer. Stuff! Nothing worse than that, said the fox. If you give me your fattest weather, I'll soon set you free. See if I don't. Yes, the man gave his word and swore he would keep it true. Well, when you come with Dobbin tomorrow for the bear, said the fox, I'll make a clatter up in the heap of stones yonder, and so when the bear asks what the noise is you must say it is peter the marksman who is the best shot in the world and after that you must help yourself now the next day off set the man and when he met the bear something began to make a clatter up in the heap of stones hist hist what is that said the bear oh that's peter the marksman to be sure said the man he's the best shot in the world i know him by his voice have you seen any bear about here eric shouted out a voice in the wood say no said the bear no i haven't seen any said eric what's that then that stands alongside your sledge bawled out the voice in the wood say it's an old fir stump said the bear oh it's only an old fir stump said the man such fir stumps we take in our country and roll them on our sledges bawled out the voice if you can't do it yourself i'll come and help you say you can help yourself and roll me on the sledge said the bear no thank ye i can help myself well enough said the man and rolled the bear on the sledge such fir stumps we always bind fast on our sledges in our part of the world bawled out the voice shall i come and help you say you can help yourself and buy me fast do said the bear no thanks i can help myself well enough said the man who set to binding bruin fast with all the ropes he had so that at last the bear couldn't stir a paw 
such fir stumps we always drive our axe into in our part of the world bawled out the voice for then we guide them better going down steep pitches pretend to drive the axe into me do now said the bear then the man took up his axe and at one blow split the bear's skull so that bruin lay dead in a trice and so the man and the fox were great friends and on best of terms but when they came near the farm the fox said i've no mind to go right home with you for i can't say i like your dogs so i'll just wait here and you can bring the weather to me but mind you pick out one nice and fat yes the man would be sure to do that and thanked the fox much for his help so when he had put the horse into the stable he went across to the sheep pen where are you going asked his wife oh i am only going over to the sheep pen to fetch a fat ram for the good fox who saved our horse said the man as i have promised him one why on earth give that thief of a fox any ram said the woman we have got the horse quite safe and the bear besides and the fox has stolen more geese from us than the ram is worth or if he hasn't already taken them he is sure to do some time no take the most savage pair of these dogs of yours and let them loose on him then perhaps we'll get rid of that thieving old rascal said the woman the man thought this was sensible advice and took two of his savage red dogs put them in a bag and set out with them have you got the ram said the fox yes come and fetch it said the man undoing the string round the bag and setting the dogs at the fox ugh said the fox bounding away the old saying well done ill paid is only too true and now i find it is also true that one's relations are one's worst enemies and he panted as he saw the red dogs at his heels end of chapter eighty three Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 84 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggum. Reynard and Chancellor. Once upon a time there was a cock who stood on a dung heap and crew and flapped his wings. Then the fox came by. Good day, said Reynard. I heard you crowing so nicely. But can you stand on one leg and crow and wink your eyes? Oh, yes, said the chancellor. I can do that very well. So he stood on one leg and crow, but he winked only with one eye. And when he had done that, he made himself big and flapped his wings, as though he had done a great thing. Very pretty, to be sure, said Reynard. Almost as pretty as when the person preaches in church. But can you stand on one leg and wink both your eyes at once? I hardly think you can. Can't I, though? said the Chancellor, and stood on one leg and winked both his eyes and crew. But Reynard caught hold of him, took him by the throat, and threw him over his back, so that he was off to the wood before he had crowed his crow out, as fast as Reynard could lay legs to the ground. When they had come under an old spruce fir, Reynard threw Chancellor on the ground, and set his paw on his breast, and was going to take a bite. "'You are heathen, Reynard,' said Chancellor. "'Good Christians say grace, and a blessing before they eat. But Reynard would be no heathen. God forbid it. So he let go his hold, and was about to fold his paws over his breast, and say grace, when pop! up flew chancellor into a tree you shan't get off for all that said reynard to himself 
so he went away and came again with a few chips which the woodcutters had left chancelier peeped and peered to see what they could be what in the world have you there he asked these are letters i have just got said reynard wouldn't you help me read them for i don't know how to read writing i'd be so happy but i dare not read them now said chancelier for here comes a hunter i see him i see him as i sit by the tree trunk when reynard heard chancelier chattering about a hunter he took to his heels as quickly as he could so this time reynard was made game of again end of chapter eighty four recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter eighty five of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c tales of laughter by nora archibald smith and kate douglas wiggin father bruin in the corner once on a time there was a man who lived far far away in the wood he had many many goats and sheep but never a one could he keep for fear of Greylegs the wolf at last he said i'll soon trap gray boots so he set to work digging a pitfall when he had dug it deep enough he put a pole down in the midst of the pit and on top of the pole he set a board and on the board he put a little dog over the pit itself he spread boughs and branches and leaves and other rubbish and atop of all he strewed snow so that Greylegs might not see there was a pit underneath so when it got on in the night the little dog grew weary of sitting there bow wow bow wow it said and bayed at the moon just then up came a fox slouching and sneaking and thought here was a fine time for marketing and with that gave a jump head over heels down into the pitfall and when it got a little farther on in the night the little dog got so weary and hungry and it fell to yelping and howling bow wow bow wow it cried out just at that very moment up came Greylegs, trotting and trotting he too thought he should get a fat stake and he too made a spring head over heels down into the pitfall when it was getting on toward gray dawn in the morning down fell snow with a north wind and it grew so cold that the little dog stood and froze and shivered and shook it was so weary and so hungry bow wow bow wow bow wow it called out and barked and yelped and howled then came up a bear tramping and tramping along and thought to himself how he could get a morsel for breakfast at the very top of the morning and so he thought and thought among the boughs and branches till he too went bump head over heels down into the pitfall so when it got a little farther on in the morning an old beggar wife came walking by who toddled from farm to farm with a bag on her back when she set eyes on the little dog that stood there and howled she couldn't help going near to look and see if any wild beasts had fallen into the pit during the night so she crawled up on her knees and peeped down into it art thou come into the pit at last reynard said she to the fox for he was the first she saw a very good place too for such hen roost robber as thou and thou too gray paw said she to the wolf many a goat and sheep hast thou torn and rent and now thou shalt be plagued and punished to death bless my heart thou too bruin art thou too sitting in this room thou mare flayer thee too will we strip 
and thee shall we flay, and thy skull shall be nailed up on the wall. All this the old lass screeched out as she bent over toward the bear, but just then her bag fell over her ears and dragged her down, and slap! Down went the old crone, head over heels into the pitfall. So there they all four sat and glared at one another, each in a corner, fox in one, gray legs in another, Bruin in a third, and the old crone in a fourth. But as soon as it was broad daylight, Reynard began to peep and peer, and to twist and turn about, for he thought he might as well try to get out. But the old lass cried out, Canst thou not sit still, thou whirligig thief, and not go twisting and turning? Only look at Father Bruin himself in the corner, how he sits as grave as a judge. For now she thought she might as well make friends with the bear. But just then up came the man who owned the pitfall. First he drew up the old wife, and after that he slew all the beasts, and spared neither Father Bruin himself in the corner, nor Greylegs, nor Reynard, the whirligig thief. That night, at least, he thought he had made a good haul. End of chapter 85 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 86 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin Chapter 86 Why the Sea is Salt Once upon a time, long, long ago, there were two brothers, the one rich and the other poor. When Christmas Eve came, the poor one had not a bite in the house, either of meat or bread, so he went to his brother and begged him in heaven's name to give him something for Christmas Day. It was by no means the first time that the brother had been forced to give something to him, and he was not better pleased at being asked now than he generally was. "'If you will do what I ask you, you shall have a whole ham,' said he. The poor one immediately thanked him and promised this. "'Well, here is the ham, and now you must go straight to Dead Man's Hall,' said the rich brother, throwing the ham to him. "'Well, I will do what I have promised,' said the other, and he took the ham and set off. He went on and on for the live-long day, and at nightfall he came to a place where there was a bright light. "'I have no doubt this is the place,' thought the man with the ham, and he drew near an old man with a long white beard who was standing in the outhouse chopping yule logs. "'Good evening,' said the man with the ham. "'Good evening to you. Where are you going at this late hour?' said the man. "'I am going to Dead Man's Hall, if only I am in the right track,' answered the poor man." "'Oh, yes, you are right enough, for it is here,' said the old man. "'When you get inside, they will all want to buy your ham, "'for they don't get much meat to eat there. "'But you must not sell it unless you can get for it "'the hand-mill which stands behind the door. "'When you come out again, I will teach you how to stop the hand-mill, "'which is useful for almost everything.' "'So the man with the ham thanked the other for his good advice "'and rapped at the door. "'When he got in, everything happened just as the old man had said it would.' All the people, great and small, came round him like ants on an anthill, and each tried to outbid the other for the ham. By rights, my old woman and I ought to have it for our Christmas dinner, but since you have set your hearts upon it, I must just give it up to you, said the man. But if I sell it, I will have the handmill which is standing there behind the door. At first they would not hear to this, and haggled and bargained with the man, but he stuck to what he had said, and the people were forced to give him the handmill. When the man came out again into the yard, he asked the old woodcutter how he was to stop the handmill, and when he had learned that, he thanked him and set off home with all the speed he could, but did not get there till after the clock had struck twelve on Christmas Eve. "'But where in the world have you been?' said the old woman. "'Here I have sat, waiting hour after hour, and have not even two sticks to lay across each other under the Christmas porridge-pot.' Oh, I could not come before. I had something of importance to see about, and a long way to go, too. But now you shall see, said the man, and then he set the hand-mill on the table, and bade it first grind light, then a tablecloth, and then meat, and beer, 
and everything else that was good for a Christmas Eve supper, and the mill ground all that he ordered. "'Bless me,' said the old woman, as one thing after another appeared, and she wanted to know where her husband had got the mill from, but he would not tell her that. "'Never mind where I got it. You can see that it is a good one, and the water that turns it will never freeze,' said the man. So he ground meat and drink and all kinds of good things to last all Christmas tide, and on the third day he invited all his friends to come to a feast. Now when the rich brother saw all that there was at the banquet and in the house, he was both vexed and angry, for he grudged everything his brother had. On Christmas Eve he was so poor that he came to me and begged for a trifle, for heaven's sake, and now he gives a feast as if he were both a count and a king, thought he. But tell me, I pray you, where you got your riches from, said he to his brother. From behind the door, said he who owned the mill, for he did not choose to satisfy his brother on that point. But later in the evening, when he had taken a drop too much, he could not refrain from telling how he had come by the hand mill. There you see what has brought me all my wealth, said he, and brought out the mill and made it grind first one thing and then another. When the brother saw that, he insisted on having the mill, and after a great deal of persuasion got it, but he had to give three hundred dollars for it, and the poor brother was to keep it till the haymaking was over, for he thought, if I keep it as long as that, I can make it grind meat and drink that will last many a long year. During that time you may imagine that the mill did not grow rusty, and when the hay harvest came the rich brother got it, but the other had taken good care not to teach him how to stop it. It was evening when the rich man got the mill home, and in the morning he bade his wife go out and spread the hay after the mowers, and he would attend to the house himself that day. So when dinner time drew near, he set the mill on the kitchen table and said, Grind herrings and milk pottage, and do it both quickly and well. So the mill began to grind herrings and milk pottage, and first all the dishes and tubs were filled, and then the food came out all over the kitchen floor. The man twisted and turned the mill and did all he could to make it stop, but howsoever he turned and screwed, it went on grinding, and in a short time the pottage rose so high that the man was like to be drowned. So he threw open the parlor door, but it was not long before the mill had ground the parlor full too, and it was with difficulty and danger that the man could go through the stream of pottage and get hold of the door latch. When he had the door open, he did not stay long in the room, but ran out, and the herrings and pottage came after him and streamed out over both farm and field. Now the wife, who was out spreading the hay, began to think dinner was long and coming, and said to the women and the mowers, Though the master does not call us home, we may as well go. It may be that he finds he is not good at making pottage, and I should do well to help him. So they began to straggle homeward, but when they had got a little way up the hill, they met the herrings and pottage and bread all pouring forth and winding about one over the other, and the man himself in front of a flood. Would to heaven that each of you had a hundred stomachs! Take care that you are not drowned in the pottage, he cried, as he went by them as if mischief were at his heels, down to where his brother dwelt. Then he begged him, for pity's sake, to take the mill back again, and that in an instant, for, said he, if it grinds one hour more, the whole district will be destroyed by herrings and pottage. But the brother would not take it until the other paid him three hundred dollars, and that he was obliged to do. Now the poor brother had both the money and the mill again. So it was not long before he had a farmhouse much finer than that in which his brother lived, but the mill ground him so much money that he covered it with plates of gold and the farmhouse lay close to the seashore, so it shone and glittered far out to sea. Everyone who sailed by there now had to put in to visit the rich man in the gold farmhouse, and every one wanted to see the wonderful mill, for the report of it spread far and wide, and there was no one who had not heard tell of it. After a long, long time a skipper came who wished to see the mill. He asked if it could make salt. Yes, it could make salt, said he who owned it, and when the skipper heard that, he wished with all his might and main to have the mill, let it cost what it might, for, he thought, if he had it, he would get off having to sail far away over the perilous sea for freights of salt. At first the man would not hear of parting with it, but the skipper begged and prayed, and at last the man sold it to him, and got many, many thousand dollars for it. When the skipper had the mill on his back, 
He did not stay long there, for he was so afraid that the man would change his mind, and he had no time to ask how he was to stop its grinding, but got on board his ship as fast as he could. When he had gone a little way out to sea, he took the mill on deck. Grind salt and grind both quickly and well, said the skipper. So the mill began to grind salt till it spouted out like water, and when the skipper had the ship filled, he wanted to stop the mill. But whichever way he turned it, and howsoever much he tried, it went on grinding, and the heap of salt grew higher and higher, until at last the ship sank. There lies the mill at the bottom of the sea, and still, day by day, it grinds on. And that is why the sea is salt. End of chapter 86 Recording by Evan Smith Chapter number 87 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggum good brand on the hillside there was once upon a time a man whose name was Goodbrand. he had a farm which lay far away up on the side of a hill and therefore they called him Goodbrand on the hillside he and his wife lived so happily together and agreed so well that whatever the man did the wife thought it so well done that no one could do it better no matter what he did she thought it was always the right thing they lived on their own farm and had a hundred dollars at the bottom of their chest and two cows in their cow shed one day the woman said to gudbrand i think we ought to go to town with one of the cows and sell it so that we may have some ready money by us we are pretty well off and ought to have a few shillings in our pocket like other people the hundred dollars in the chest we mustn't touch but i can't see what we want with more than one cow and it will be much better for us as i shall have only one to look after instead of the two i have now to mind and feed yes goodbrand thought that was well and sensibly spoken he took the cow at once and went to town to sell it but when he got there no one would buy the cow ah well thought goodbrand i may as well take the cow home again i know i have both stall and food for it and the way home is no longer than it was here so he strolled homeward again with the cow when he had got a bit on the way he met a man who had a horse to sell goodbrand thought it was better to have a horse than a cow and so he changed the cow for the horse when he had gone a bit farther he met a man who was driving a fat pig before him and then he thought it would be better to have a fat pig than a horse and so he changed with the man he now went a bit farther and then he met a man with a goat and so he thought it was surely better to have a goat than a pig and changed with the man who had the goat then he went a long way till he met a man who had a sheep he changed with him for he thought it was always better to have a sheep than a goat when he had got a bit farther he met a man with a goose and so he changed the sheep for the goose and when he had gone a long long way he met a man with a cock he changed the goose with him for he thought this wise it is surely better to have a cock than a goose he walked on till late in the day when he began to feel hungry so he sold the cock for sixpence and bought some food for himself for it is always better to keep body and soul together than to have a cock thought goodbrand then he set off again homeward till he came to his neighbor's farm 
and there he went in how did you get on in town asked the people oh only so so said the man i can't boast of my luck nor can i grumble at it either and then he told them how it had gone with him from first to last well you'll have a fine reception when you get home to your wife said the man heaven help you i should not like to be in your place i think i might have fared much worse said goodbrand but whether i have fared well or ill i have such a kind wife that she never says anything no matter what i do eh so you say but you won't get me to believe it said the neighbor shall we have a wager on it said goodbrand i have a hundred dollars in my chest at home will you lay the same so they made the wager and goodbrand remained there till the evening when it began to get dark and then they went together to the farm the neighbor was to remain outside the door and listen while goodbrand went in to his wife good evening said goodbrand when he came in good evening said the wife heaven be praised you are back again yes here i am said the man and then the wife asked him how he had got on in town oh so so answered goodbrand not much to brag of when i came to town no one would buy the cow so i changed it for a horse oh i'm so glad of that said the woman we are pretty well off and we ought to drive to church like other people and when we can afford to keep a horse i don't see why we should not have one run out children and put the horse in the stable well i haven't got the horse after all said goodbrand for when i had got a bit on the way i changed it for a pig dear me cried the woman that's the very thing i should have done myself i'm so glad of it for now we can have some bacon in the house and something to offer people when they come to see us what do we want with a horse people will only say we have become so grand that we could no longer walk to church run out children and let the pig in but i haven't got the pig either said goodbrand for when i had got a bit farther on the road i changed it into a milch goat dear dear how well you manage everything cried his wife when i really come to think of it what do i want with the pig people would only say over yonder they eat up everything they have no now i have a goat i can have both milk and cheese and keep the goat into the bargain let in the goat children but i haven't got the goat either said goodbrand when i got a bit on the way i changed the goat and got a fine sheep for it well returned the woman you do everything just as i should wish it just as if i had been there myself what do we want with a goat i should have to climb up hill and down dale to get it home at night no when i have a sheep i can have wool and clothes in the house and food as well run out children and let in the sheep but i haven't got the sheep any longer said goodbrand for when i had got a bit on the way i changed it for a goose well thank you for that said the woman and many thanks too what do i want with a sheep i have neither wheel nor spindle and i do not care to toil and drudge making clothes we can buy clothes now as before now i can have goose fat which i have so long been wishing for and some feathers to stuff that little pillow of mine run children and let in the goose well i haven't got the goose either said goodbrand when i had got a bit farther on the way i changed it for a cock well i don't know how you can think of it all cried the woman it's just as if i had done it all myself a cock why 
it's just the same as if you'd bought an eight-day clock for every morning the cock will crow at four so we can be up in good time what do we want with a goose i can't make goose fat and i can easily fill my pillow with some soft grass run children and let in the cock but i haven't the cock either said goodbrand for when i had got a bit farther i became so terribly hungry i had to sell the cock for sixpence and get some food to keep body and soul together heaven be praised you did that cried the woman whatever you do you always do the very thing i could have wished besides what did i want with the cock we are our own masters and can lie as long as we like in the mornings heaven be praised as long as i have got you back again and who manage everything so well i shall neither want cock nor goose nor pig nor cows goodbrand then opened the door have i won the hundred dollars now he asked and the neighbor was obliged to confess that he had end of chapter eighty seven recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter eighty eight of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 88. The Pancake. Once on a time there was a goody who had seven hungry bairns, and she was frying a pancake for them. It was a sweet milk pancake, and there it lay in the pan, bubbling and frizzling so thick and good, it was a sight for sore eyes to look at and the bairn stood round about, and the good man sat by and looked on. "'Oh, give me a bit of pancake, mother dear, I am so hungry,' said one bairn. "'Oh, darling mother,' said the second. "'Oh, darling good mother,' said the third. "'Oh, darling good nice mother,' said the fourth. "'Oh, darling pretty good nice mother,' said the fifth. "'Oh, darling pretty good nice clever mother,' said the sixth. "'Oh, darling pretty good nice clever sweet mother,' said the seventh. So they begged for the pancake all round, and one more prettily than the other, for they were so hungry and so good. Yes, yes, bairns, only bide a bit till it turns itself. She ought to have said, till I can get it turned. But then you shall all have some, a lovely sweet milk pancake, only look how fat and happy it lies there. When the pancake heard that, it got afraid, and in a trice it turned itself all of itself and tried to jump out of the pan but it fell back into it again the other side up and so when it had been fried a little on the other side too till it got firmer in its flesh it sprang out on the floor and rolled off like a wheel through the door and down the hill Aloha, stop pancake and away went the goody after it with the frying pan in one hand and the ladle in the other as fast as she could and her bairns behind her while the good man limped after them last of all hi won't you stop seize it stop pancake they all screamed out one after the other and tried to catch it on the run and hold it but the pancake rolled on and on and in the twinkling of an eye it was so far ahead that they couldn't see it for the pancake was faster on its feet than any of them so when it had rolled a while it met a man good day pancake said the man god bless you manny panny said the pancake dear pancake said the man don't roll so fast. Stop a little and let me eat you. When I have given the slip to Goody Puddy and the good men and seven squalling children, I may well slip through your fingers, Manny Panny, said the pancake, and rolled on and on till it met a hen. Good day, pancake, said the hen. The same to you, Henny Penny, said the pancake. Pancake, dear, don't roll so fast. Bide a bit and let me eat you up, said the hen. When I have given the slip to Goody Puddy and the Goodman and seven squalling children and Manny Panny, I may well slip through your claws, Henny Penny, said the pancake, and so it rolled on like a wheel down the road. Just then it met a cock. Good day, pancake, said the cock. The same to you, cocky locky, said the pancake. Pancake, dear, don't roll so fast, but bide a bit and let me eat you up. 
when I have given the slip to Goody Puddy and the Goodman and seven squalling children and to Manny Panny and Henny Penny, I may well slip through your claws, Cocky Locky, said the pancake, and off it set, rolling away as fast as it could, and when it had rolled a long way, it met a duck. Good day, pancake, said the duck. The same to you, ducky lucky. Pancake, dear, don't roll away so fast. Bide a bit and let me eat you up. When I have given the slip to Goody Puddy and the Goodman and seven squalling children and Manny Panny and Henny Penny and Cocky Locky, I may well slip through your fingers, Ducky Lucky, said the Pancake, and with that it took to rolling and rolling faster than ever, and when it had rolled a long, long while, it met a goose. Good day, Pancake, said the goose. The same to you, Goosey Poosey. Pancake, dear, don't roll so fast. Bide a bit and let me eat you up. When I have given the slip to Goody Puddy and the Goodman and seven squalling children and Manny Panny and Henny Penny and Cocky Locky and Ducky Lucky, I can well slip through your feet, Goosey Poosey, said the Pancake, and off it rolled. So when it had rolled a long, long way farther, it met a gander. Good day, Pancake, said the gander. The same to you, Gander Pander, said the Pancake. Pancake, dear, don't roll so fast. Bide a bit and let me eat you up. When I have given the slip to Goody Puddy and the Goodman and seven squalling children and Manny Panny and Henny Penny and Cocky Locky and Ducky Lucky and Goosey Poosey, I may well slip through your feet, Gander Pander, said the Pancake, and it rolled off as fast as ever. So when it had rolled a long, long time, it met a pig. Good day, Pancake, said the pig. The same to you, Piggy Wiggy, said the Pancake, which, without a word more, began to roll and roll like mad. Nay, nay, said the pig, you needn't be in such a hurry. We two can then go side by side and see each other over the wood. They say it is not too safe in there. The Pancake thought there might be something in that, and so they kept company. But when they had gone a while, they came to a brook. As for Piggy, he was so fat he swam safely across. It was nothing to him, but the poor Pancake couldn't get over. Seat yourself on my snout, said the pig, and I'll carry you over. So the Pancake did that. Oof, oof, said the pig, and swallowed the Pancake in one gulp, and then, as the poor Pancake could go no farther, why, this story can go no farther either. End of chapter 88 Recording by Evan Smith Chapter 89 of Tales of Laughter this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggum. The Death of Chancellor. Once on a time, there was a cock and a hen who walked out into the field and scratched and scraped and scrabbled all at once chanchelier found a burr of hop and partlet found a barley corn and they said they would make malt and brew yule ale oh i pluck barley and i malt malt and i brew ale and the ale is good crackled dame partlet is the wart strong enough crew chancellor as he crowed he flew up on the edge of the cask and tried to have a taste but just as he bent over to drink a drop he took to flapping his wings and so he fell head over heels into the cask and was drowned when dame partlet saw that she clean lost her wits and flew up into the chimney corner and fell a screaming and screeching out harm in the house harm in the house she screeched out all in a breath and there was no stopping her what ails you dame partlet that you sit there sobbing and sighing said the hand quern why not said dame partlet when goodman chancellor has fallen into the cask and drowned himself and lies dead that's why i sigh and sob well if i can do naught else i will grind and groan said the hand quern 
and so it fell to grinding as fast as it could when the chair heard that it said what ails you hancorn that you grind and groan so fast and oft why not when goodman chancellor has fallen into the cask and drowned himself and dame partlet sits in the ingle and sighs and sobs that's why i grind and groan said the hancorn if i can do naught else i will crack said the chair and with that he fell to creaking and cracking when the door heard that it said what's the matter why do you creak and crack so mr chair why not said the chair goodman chancellor has fallen into the cask and drowned himself dame partlet sits in the ingle sighing and sobbing and the hand-quern grimes and groans that's why i creak and crackle and croak and crack well said the door if i can do naught else i can rattle and bang and whistle and slam and with that it began to open and shut and bang and slam it deaved one to hear and all one's teeth chattered all this the stove heard and it opened its mouth and called out door door why all this slamming and banging why not said the door when goodman chancellor has fallen into the cask and drowned himself dame parlet sits in the ingle sighing and sobbing the handquern grinds and groans and the chair creaks and cracks that's why i bang and slam well said the stove if i can do naught else i can smoulder and smoke so it fell a smoking and steaming till the room was all in a cloud the axe saw this as it stood outside and peeped with its shaft through the window what's all this smoke about mr stove said the axe in a sharp voice why not said the stove when goodman chancellor has fallen into the cask and drowned himself dame partlet sits in the ingle sighing and sobbing the handquern grinds and groans the chair creaks and cracks the door bangs and slams that's why i smoke and steam well if i can do naught else i can riv and rend said the axe and with that it fell to riving and rending all around about this the aspen stood by and saw why do you riv and rend everything so mr axe said the aspen goodman chancellor has fallen into the ale cask and drowned himself said the axe dame parlet is sitting in the ingle sighing and sobbing the handquern grinds and groans the chair creaks and cracks the door slams and bangs and the stove smokes and steams that's why i riv and rend all about well if i can do naught else said the aspen i can quiver and quake in all my leaves so it grew all of a quake the birds saw this and twittered out why do you quiver and quake miss aspen goodman chancellor has fallen into the isle cask and drowned himself said the aspen with trembling voice dame partlet sits in the ingle sighing and sobbing the handquern grinds and groans the chair creaks and cracks the door slams and bangs the stove steams and smokes and the axe rives and rends that's why i quiver and quake well if we can do naught else we will pluck off all our feathers said the birds and with that they fell a piling and plucking themselves till the room was full of feathers this the master stood by and saw and when the feathers flew about like fun he asked the birds why do you pluck off all your feathers you birds oh goodman chancellor has fallen into the ale cask and drowned himself twittered out 
the birds dame parlette sits sighing and sobbing in the ingle the hand corn grinds and groans the chair creaks and cracks the door slams and bangs the stove smokes and steams the axe rives and rends and the aspen quivers and quakes that's why we are piling and plucking all our feathers off well if i can do nothing else i can tear the brooms asunder said the man with that he fell tearing and tossing the brooms till the birch twigs fell about east and west the goody stood cooking porridge for supper and saw all this why man she called out what are you tearing the brooms to bits for oh said the man goodman chancellor has fallen into the ale vat and drowned himself dame parlette sits sighing and sobbing in the ingle the hand corn grinds and groans the chair cracks and creaks the door slams and bangs the stove smokes and steams the axe rives and rends the aspen quivers and quakes the birds are piling and plucking all their feathers off and that's why i am tearing the besoms two bits so so said the goody then i'll dash the porridge all over the walls and she did it for she took one spoonful after the other and dashed it against the walls so that no one could see what they were made of for very porridge that is was how they drank the burial ale after goodman chancellor who fell into the brewing vat and was drowned and if you don't believe it you may set off thither and have a taste both of the ale and the porridge end of chapter eighty nine recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter ninety of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 90. Reynard Wants to Taste Horse Flesh. One day, as Bruin lay by a horse which he had slain and was hard at work eating it, Reynard came along that way, and came up spying about and licking his lips to see if he might get a taste of the horse flesh. So he doubled and turned till he got just behind Bruin's back, and then he jumped on the other side of the carcass and snapped a mouthful as he ran by. Bruin was not slow either, for he made a grab at Reynard and caught the tip of his red brush in his paw, and ever since then Reynard's brush is white at the tip, as any one may see. But that day Bruin was merry and called out, Bide a bit, Reynard, and come hither, and I'll tell you how to catch a horse for yourself. Yes, Reynard was ready enough to learn, but he did not for all that trust himself to go very close to Bruin. Listen, said Bruin, when you see a horse asleep, basking in the sunshine, you must mind and bind yourself fast by the hair of his tail to your brush, and then you must make your teeth meet in the flesh of his thigh. As you may fancy, it was not long before Reynard found out a horse that lay asleep in the sunshine, and then he did as Bruin had told him, for he knotted and bound himself well into the hair of his tail, and made his teeth meet in the horse's thigh. Up sprang the horse and began to kick and rear and gallop, so that Reynard was dashed against stock and stone and got battered black and blue, so that he was not far off losing both wit and sense and while the horse galloped they passed Jack Longears, the hare. "'Whither away so fast, Reynard?' cried Jack Longears. "'Post haste on business of life and death, dear Jack,' cried Reynard. And with that Jack stood upon his hind legs and laughed till his sides ached and his jaws split right up to his ears. It was so funny to see Reynard ride post haste. But you must know, since that ride Reynard has never thought of catching a horse for himself, for that once, at least, it was Bruin who had the best of it in wit, though they do say he is nearly always as simple-minded as the trolls. End of chapter 90 Recording by Evan Smith Chapter 91 of Tales of Laughter 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 91. Bruin and Reynard Partners. Once on a time, Bruin and Reynard were to own a field in common. They had a little clearing up in the wood, and the first year they sowed rye. Now we must share the crop as is fair and right, said Reynard. If you like to have the root, I'll take the top. Yes, Bruin was ready to do that, but when they had threshed out the crop, Reynard got all the corn, but Bruin got nothing but roots and rubbish. He did not like that at all, but Reynard said it was how they had agreed to share it. This year I have the gain, said Reynard. Next year it will be your turn. Then you shall have the top, and I shall have to put up with the root. But when the spring came and it was time to sow, Reynard asked Bruin what he thought of turnips. Ay, ay, said Bruin, that's better food than corn, and so Reynard thought also. But when harvest came, Reynard got the roots, while Bruin got the turnip tops. And then Bruin was so angry with Reynard that he put an end at once to his partnership with him. End of chapter 91 Recording by Evan Smith Chapter 92 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin Chapter 92 Pork and Honey At dawn the other day, when Bruin came tramping over the bog with a fat pig, Reynard sat up on a stone by the moorside. "'Good day, grandsire,' said the fox. "'What's that so nice that you have there?' "'Pork,' said Bruin. "'Well, I have got a dainty bit, too,' said Reynard. "'What is that?' asked the bear. "'The biggest wild bee's comb I ever saw in my life,' said Reynard. "'Indeed, you don't say so,' said Bruin, who grinned and licked his lips. He thought it would be so nice to taste a little honey. At last he said, "'Shall we swap our fare?' "'Nay, nay,' said Reynard, "'I can't do that.' The end was that they made a bet and agreed to name three trees. If the fox could say them off faster than the bear, he was to have leave to take one bite of the bacon. But if the bear could say them faster, he was to have leave to take one sup out of the comb. Greedy Bruin thought he was sure to sup out all the honey in one breath. Well, said Reynard, it's all fair and right, no doubt, but all I say is, if I win, you shall be bound to tear off the bristles where I am to bite. "'Of course,' said Bruin. "'I'll help you, as you can't help yourself.' So they were to begin and name the trees. "'Fir, Scotch fir, spruce,' growled out Bruin, for he was gruff in his tongue. That he was. But for all that he only named two trees, for fir and Scotch fir are both the same. "'Ash, aspen, oak,' screamed Reynard, so that the wood rang again. So he had won the wager, and down he ran and took the heart out of the pig at one bite, and was just running off with it, but Bruin was angry because Reynard had taken the best bit out of the whole pig, and so he laid hold of his tail and held him fast. Stop a bit, stop a bit, he said, and was wild with rage. Never mind, said the fox, it's all right, let me go, grandsire, and I'll give you a taste of my honey. When Bruin heard that, he let go his hold, and away went Reynard after the honey. Here, on this honeycomb, said Reynard, lies a leaf, and under this leaf is a hole, and that hole you are to suck. As he said this, he held up the comb under the bear's nose, took off the leaf, jumped up on a stone, and began to gibber and laugh, for there was neither honey nor honeycomb, but a wasp's nest, as big as a man's head, full of wasps, and out swarmed the wasps, and settled on Bruin's head, and stung him in the eyes and ears and mouth and snout, and he had such hard work to rid himself of them, that he had no time to think of Reynard. And that's why, ever since that day, Bruin is so afraid of wasps. End of chapter 92 Recording by Evan Smith Chapter 93 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin 
Chapter 93 How Reynard Outwitted Bruin Once on a time there was a bear who sat on a hillside in the sun and slept. Just then Reynard came slouching by and caught sight of him. "'There you sit, taking your ease, grandsire,' said the fox. "'Now see if I don't play you a trick.' So he went and caught three field mice and laid them on a stump close under Bruin's nose, and then he bawled out into his ear, "'Bo, Bruin, here's Peter the hunter just behind this stump.' And as he bawled this out, he ran off through the wood as fast as ever he could. Bruin woke up with a start, and when he saw the three little mice, he was as mad as a March hare, and was going to lift up his paw and crush them, for he thought it was they who had bellowed in his ear. But just as he lifted it, he caught sight of Reynard's tail among the bushes in the woodside, and away he set after him, so that the underwood crackled as he went, and to tell the truth, Bruin was so close upon Reynard that he caught hold of his off hind foot, just as he was crawling into an earth under a pine root. So there was Reynard in a pinch, but for all that he had his wits about him, for he screeched out, Slip the pine root and catch Reynard's foot! And so the silly bear let his foot slip and laid hold of the root instead. But by that time Reynard was safe inside the earth and called out, I cheated you that time, didn't I, grandsire? Out of sight isn't out of mind, growled Bruin down the earth, and was wild with rage. End of chapter 93 Recording by Evan Smith Chapter 94 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin Chapter 94 Nanny Who Wouldn't Go Home to Supper there was once upon a time a woman who had a son and a goat. The son was called Espen, and the goat was called Nanny. But they were not good friends and did not get on together, for the goat was perverse and wayward, as goats will be, and she would never go home at the right time for her supper. So it happened one evening that Espen went out to fetch her home, and when he had been looking for her a while, he saw Nanny high, high up on a crag. "'My dear Nanny, you must not stay any longer up there. "'You must come home now. It is just supper time. "'I am so hungry and want my supper.' "'No, I shan't,' said Nanny. "'Not before I have finished the grass on this tussock, "'and that tussock, and this and that tussock.' "'Then I'll go and tell Mother,' said the lad. "'That you may, and then I shall be left to eat in peace,' said Nanny. "'So Espen went and told his mother. "'Go to the fox and ask him to bite Nanny,' said his mother." The lad went to the fox. My dear fox, bite Nanny, for Nanny won't come home in time. I am so hungry and I want my supper, said Espen. No, I don't want to spoil my snout on pig's bristles and goat's beard, said the fox. So the lad went and told his mother. Well, go to the wolf, said his mother. The lad went to the wolf. My dear wolf, tear the fox, for the fox won't bite Nanny and Nanny won't come home in time. I am so hungry and I want my supper. No, said the wolf, I won't wear out my paws and teeth on a skinny fox. So the lad went and told his mother. Well, go to the bear and ask him to slay the wolf, said the mother. The lad went to the bear. My dear bear, slay the wolf, for the wolf won't tear the fox, and the fox won't bite Nanny, and Nanny won't come home in time. I am so hungry and want my supper. No, that I won't, said the bear. I don't want to wear out my claws for that. So the lad went and told his mother. Well, go to the Finn and ask him to shoot the bear. The lad went to the Finn. My dear Finn, shoot the bear, for the bear won't slay the wolf, the wolf won't tear the fox, the fox won't bite Nanny, and Nanny won't come home in time. I am so hungry and want my supper. No, I will not, said the Finn. I am not going to shoot away my bullets for that. So the lad went and told his mother. Well, go to the fir, said the mother, and ask it to crush the Finn. The lad went to the fir tree. My dear fur, crush the fin, for the fin won't shoot the bear, the bear won't slay the wolf, the wolf won't tear the fox, the fox won't bite Nanny, and Nanny won't come home in time. I am so hungry and want my supper. No, I will not, said the fur. I am not going to break my boughs for that. So the lad went and told his mother. Well, go to the fire, said his mother, and ask it to burn the fur. The lad went to the fire. 
My dear fire, burn the fur, for the fur won't crush the fin, the fin won't shoot the bear, the bear won't slay the wolf, the wolf won't tear the fox, the fox won't bite Nanny, and Nanny won't come home in time. I am so hungry and want my supper. No, I will not, said the fire. I am not going to burn myself out for that. So the lad went and told his mother. Well, go to the water and ask it to quench the fire, she said. The lad went to the water. My dear water, quench the fire, for the fire won't burn the fur, the fur won't crush the fin, the fin won't shoot the bear, the bear won't slay the wolf, the wolf won't tear the fox, the fox won't bite Nanny, and Nanny won't come home in time. I am so hungry and want my supper. No, I will not, said the water. I am not going to waste myself for that. So the lad went and told his mother. Well, go to the ox, said she, and ask him to drink up the water. The lad went to the ox. My dear ox, drink up the water, for the water won't quench the fire, the fire won't burn the fur, the fur won't crush the fin, the fin won't shoot the bear, the bear won't slay the wolf, the wolf won't tear the fox, the fox won't bite Nanny, and Nanny won't come home in time. I am so hungry and want my supper. No, I will not, said the ox. I am not going to burst myself for that. So the lad went and told his mother. Well, go to the oak, said she, and ask it to throttle the ox. The lad went to the yoke. My dear yoke, throttle the ox, for the ox won't drink the water, the water won't quench the fire, the fire won't burn the fur, the fur won't crush the fin, the fin won't shoot the bear, the bear won't slay the wolf, the wolf won't tear the fox, the fox won't bite Nanny, and Nanny won't come home in time. I am so hungry and want my supper. No, I will not, said the yoke. I am not going to break myself in two for that. So the lad went and told his mother. Well, go to the axe, said she, and tell it to split the yoke. The lad went to the axe. My dear axe, split the yoke, for the yoke won't throttle the ox, the ox won't drink the water, the water won't quench the fire, the fire won't burn the fur, the fur won't crush the fin, the fin won't shoot the bear, the bear won't slay the wolf, the wolf won't tear the fox, the fox won't bite Nanny, and Nanny won't come home in time. I am so hungry and want my supper. No, I will not, said the axe. I am not going to blunt my edge for that. So the lad went and told his mother. Well, go to the smith, said she, and ask him to hammer the axe. The lad went to the smith. My dear smith, hammer the axe, for the axe won't split the yoke. The yoke won't throttle the ox, the ox won't drink the water, the water won't quench the fire, the fire won't burn the fur, the fur won't crush the fin, the fin won't shoot the bear, the bear won't slay the wolf, the wolf won't tear the fox, the fox won't bite Nanny, and Nanny won't come home in time. I am so hungry and want my supper. No, I will not, said the smith. I will not burn my coals and wear out my sledgehammers for that. So the lad went and told his mother. Well, go to the rope, said she, and ask it to hang the smith. The lad went to the rope. My dear rope, hang the smith, for the smith won't hammer the axe, the axe won't split the yoke, the oak won't throttle the ox, the ox won't drink the water, the water won't quench the fire, the fire won't burn the fur, the fur won't crush the fin, the fin won't shoot the bear, the bear won't slay the wolf, the wolf won't tear the fox, the fox won't bite Nanny, and Nanny won't come home in time. I am so hungry and want my supper. No, I will not, said the rope. I am not going to break in two for that. So the lad went and told his mother. Well, go to the mouse, said she, and ask her to gnaw the rope. The lad went to the mouse. My dear mouse, gnaw the rope, for the rope won't hang the smith, the smith won't hammer the axe, the axe won't split the oak, the oak won't throttle the ox, the ox won't drink the water, the water won't quench the fire, the fire won't burn the fur, the fur won't crush the fin, the fin won't shoot the bear, the bear won't slay the wolf, the wolf won't tear the fox, the fox won't bite Nanny, and Nanny won't come home in time. I am so hungry and want my supper. No, I will not, said the mouse. I am not going to wear out my teeth for that. So the lad went and told his mother. Well, go to the cat, said she, and ask her to catch the mouse. The lad went to the cat. My dear cat, catch the mouse, for the mouse won't gnaw the rope, the rope won't hang the smith, the smith won't hammer the axe, the axe won't split the yoke, the yoke won't throttle the ox, the ox won't drink the water, the water won't quench the fire, the fire won't burn the fur, the fur won't crush the fin, the fin won't shoot the bear, the bear won't slay the wolf, the wolf won't tear the fox, the fox won't bite Nanny, and Nanny won't come home in time. I am so hungry and want my supper. Yes, but give me a drop of milk for my kittens, and then, said the cat, yes, that she should have. 
So the cat caught the mouse, and the mouse gnawed the rope, and the rope hanged the smith, and the smith hammered the axe, and the axe split the yoke, and the yoke throttled the ox, and the ox drank the water, and the water quenched the fire, and the fire burned the fur, and the fur crushed the fin, and the fin shot the bear, and the bear slew the wolf, and the wolf tore the fox, and the fox bit Nanny, and Nanny took to her heels, scampered home, and ran against the barn wall, and broke one of her legs. Ma bleated the goat. There she lay, and if she isn't dead, she is still limping about on three legs. But Espen said it served her right, because she would not come home in time for supper that day. End of chapter 94 Recording by Evan Smith Chapter 95 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. The box was something pretty in it. Once on a time there was a little boy who was out walking on the road, and when he had walked a bit he found a box. I am sure there must be something pretty in this box, he said to himself, but however much he turned it, and however much he twisted it, he was not able to get it open. But when he had walked a bit further, he found a little tiny key. Then he grew tired and sat down, and all at once he thought what fun it would be if the key fitted the box, for it had a little keyhole in it. So he took the little key out of his pocket, and then he blew first into the pipe of the key, and afterward into the keyhole, and then he put the key into the keyhole and turned it. Snap! It went within the lock, and when he tried the hasp, the box was open. But can you guess what there was in the box? Why, a cow's tail! And if the cow's tail had been longer, this story would have been longer, too. End of chapter 95 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 96 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Annie Hill. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 96 The Farmer and the Troll A troll once lived in a little hill that stood in the corner of a farm. Thinking that the ground should not lie idle, the farmer came one day and began to plough it up. He had hardly begun when the troll appeared and asked, "'How dare you plough in the roof of my house?' "'I did not know it was the roof of your house,' returned the farmer. "'I thought it a pity to let such a good piece of land lie idle, and I think so still. Let me make an agreement with you.' "'What is your agreement?' said the troll. "'Well, let me see. I will plough so.' and reap the ground every year, and we will take the produce year and year about. One year you will take what grows above ground, and I will take what grows below. Then we can change around, and I will take what grows above ground, and you what grows below. What do you say? Very well, answered the troll. That will satisfy me. The agreement was then made. But the crafty farmer took care to sow carrots, the year the troll was to have what grew above ground, and corn, the year the troll was to have what grew below. So the poor elf got only carrot tops and corn roots. However, he was content, and the farmer and he lived for years amicably under this arrangement. End of chapter 96 Chapter 97 of Tales of Laughter this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. One's own children always prettiest. Once upon a time a man went out shooting in a forest, and there he met a woodcock. Pray don't shoot my children, cried the woodcock. What are your children like? asked the man. Mine are the prettiest children in the forest, answered the woodcock. I suppose I mustn't shoot them then, said the man. When he came back he carried in his hand a whole string of young woodcocks which he had shot. Oh dear, oh dear, why, you have shot my children after all, wept the woodcock. Are these yours? said the man. Why, I shot the ugliest I could find. Yes, yes, answered the woodcock, but don't you know that everyone thinks his own children the prettiest? End of chapter 97 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 98 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin Chapter 98 The Princess Whom Nobody Could Silence There was once upon a time a king, and he had a daughter who would always have the last word. She was so perverse and contrary in her speech that no one could silence her. So the king therefore promised that he who could outwit the princess should have her in marriage and half the kingdom besides. There were plenty of those who wanted to try, I can assure you, for it isn't every day that a princess and half a kingdom are to be had. The gate to the palace hardly ever stood still. The suitors came in swarms and flocks from east and west, both riding and walking. But there was no one who could silence the princess. At last the king announced that those who tried and did not succeed should be branded on both ears with a large iron. He would not have all this running about the palace for nothing. So there were three brothers who had also heard about the princess, and as they were rather badly off at home, they thought they would try their luck and see if they could win the princess and half the kingdom. They were good friends, and so they agreed to set out together. When they had got a bit on the way, Ashipaddle found a dead magpie. I have found something, I have found something, cried he. What have you found? asked the brothers. I have found a dead magpie, said he. Oh, throw it away. What can you do with that? said the other two, who always believed they were the wisest. Oh, I've nothing else to do. I can easily carry it, said Ashipaddle. When they had gone on a bit further, Ashipaddle found an old willow twig, which he picked up. I have found something, I have found something, he cried. What have you found now? said the brothers. I have found a willow twig, said he. Oh, what are you going to do with that? Throw it away, said the two. I have nothing else to do. I can easily carry it with me, said Ashipaddle. When they had gone still farther, he found a broken saucer, which he also picked up. Here, lads, I have found something. I have found something, said he. Well, what have you found now, asked the brothers. A broken saucer, said he. Oh, is it worth while dragging that along with you too? Throw it away, said the brothers. Oh, I've nothing else to do. I can easily carry it with me, said Ashipaddle. When they had gone a bit farther, he found a crooked goat horn, and soon after he found the fellow to it. I have found something, I have found something, lad, said he. What have you found now, said the others. Two goat horns, answered Ashipaddle. Oh, throw them away. What are you going to do with them, said they. Oh, I have nothing else to do. I can easily carry them with me, said Ashipaddle. In a little while he found a wedge. I say, lads, I have found something. I have found something, he cried. You are everlastingly finding something. What have you found now, asked the two eldest. I have found a wedge, he answered. Oh, throw it away. What are you going to do with it, said they. Oh, I have nothing else to do. I can easily carry it with me, said Ashipaddle. As he went across the king's fields, which had been freshly manured, he stooped down and took up an old boot sole. Hello, lads, I have found something, I have found something, said he. Heaven grant you may find a little sense before you get to the palace, said the two, 
"'What is it you have found now?' "'An old boot sole,' said he. "'Is that anything worth picking up? Throw it away. What are you going to do with it?' said the brothers. "'Oh, I have nothing else to do. I can easily carry it with me, and who knows, it may help me to win the princess and half the kingdom,' said Ashypaddle. "'Yes, you look a likely one, don't you?' said the other two. So they went in to the princess, the eldest first. "'Good day,' said he. "'Good day to you,' answered she, with a shrug. "'It's terribly hot here,' said he. "'It's hotter in the fire,' said the princess. The branding iron was lying waiting in the fire. When he saw this, he was struck speechless, and so it was all over with him. The second brother fared no better. "'Good day,' said he. "'Good day to you,' said she, with a wriggle. "'It's terribly hot here,' said he. "'It's hotter in the fire,' said she. With that he lost both speech and wits, and so the iron had to be brought out. Then came Ashypaddle's turn. "'Good day,' said he. "'Good day to you,' said she, with a shrug and a wriggle. "'It's very nice and warm here,' said Ashypaddle. "'It's warmer in the fire,' she answered. She was in no better humor now she saw the third suitor. "'Then there's a chance for me to roast my magpie on it,' said he, bringing it out. "'I'm afraid it will sputter,' said the princess. "'No fear of that. I'll tie this willow twig around it,' said the lad. "'You can't tie it tight enough,' said she. "'Then I'll drive in a wedge,' said the lad, and brought out the wedge. "'The fat will be running off it,' said the princess. "'Then I'll hold this under it,' said the lad, and showed her the broken saucer. "'You are so crooked in your speech,' said the princess. "'No, I am not crooked,' answered the lad. "'But this is crooked.' and he brought out one of the goat horns. "'Well, I've never seen the like,' cried the princess. "'Here you see the like,' said he, and he brought out the other horn. "'It seems you have come here to wear out my soul,' she said. "'No, I have not come here to wear out your soul, for I have one here which is already worn out,' answered the lad, and brought out the old boot sole. The princess was so dumbfounded at this that she was completely silenced. "'Now you are mine,' said Ashypaddle, and so he got her and half the kingdom into the bargain. End of chapter 98 Recording by Evan Smith Chapter 99 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Laura Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggum The Money Box In a nursery where a number of toys lay scattered about, a money box stood on the top of a very high wardrobe. It was made of clay in the shape of a pig and has been bought of the potter. In the back of the pig was a slit, and this slit has been enlarged with a knife, so that dollars or crown pieces might slip through, and, indeed, there were two crown pieces in the box, besides a number of pence. The money pig was stuffed so full that it could no longer rattle, which is the highest state of perfection to which a money pig can attain. There he stood upon the cupboard, high and lofty, looking down upon everything else in the room. He knew very well that he had enough inside him to buy up all the other toys, and this gave him a very good opinion of his own value. The rest thought of this fact also, although they did not speak of it, for there were so many other things to talk about. A large doll, still handsome, though rather old, for her neck had been mended, lay inside one of the drawers which was partially open. She called out to the others, Let us have a game at being men and women that is worth playing at. Upon this there was a great uproar. Even the engravings, which hung in frames on the wall, turned round in their excitement, and showed that they had a wrong side to them although they had not the least intention to expose themselves in this way, or to object to the game. It was late at night, but as the moon shone through the windows, they had light at a cheap rate, 
and as the game was now to begin all were invited to take part in it even the children's wagon which certainly belonged to the coarser playthings each has its own value said the wagon we cannot all be noblemen there must be some to do the work the money pig was the only one who received a written invitation he stood so high that they were afraid he would not accept a verbal message but in his reply he said that if he had to take part he must enjoy the sport from his own home they were to arrange for him to do so and they did the little toy theatre was therefore put up in such a way that the money pig could look directly into it some wanted to begin with a comedy and afterward to have a tea party and a discussion for mental improvement but they commenced with the latter first the rocking horse spoke of training and races the wagon of railways and steam power for these subjects belonged to each of their professions and it was right they should talk of them the clock talked politics tick tick he professed to know what the time of day but there was a whisper that he did not go correctly the bamboo cane stood by looking stiff and proud he was vain of his brass for rule and silver top and on the sofa lay two worked cushions pretty but stupid when the play at the little theatre began the rest sat and looked on they were requested to applaud and stamp and the whip to crack when they felt gratified with what they saw but the riding whip said he never cracked for old people only for the young who were not yet married i crack for everybody said the cracker yes and a fine noise you make thought the audience as the play went on it was not worth much but it was very well played and all the characters turned their painted sides to the audience for they were made only to be seen on one side the acting was wonderful excepting that sometimes they came out beyond the lamps because the wires were a little too long the doll whose neck had been darned was so excited that the place in her neck burst and the money pig declared he must do something for one of the players as they had all pleased him so much so he made up his mind to mention one of them in his will as the one to be buried with him in the family vault whenever that event should happen they all enjoyed the comedy so much that they gave up all thoughts of the tea party and only carried out their idea of intellectual amusement which they called playing at men and women and there was nothing wrong about it for it was only play all the while each one thought most of himself or of what the money pig could be thinking his thoughts were on as he supposed a very distant time of making his will and of his burial and of when it might all come to pass certainly sooner than he expected for all at once down he came from the top of the press fell on the ground and was broken to pieces then the pennies hopped and danced about in the most amusing manner the little ones twirled round like tops and the large ones rolled away as far as they could especially one of the great silver crown pieces who had often wanted to go out into the world and now he had his wish as well as all the rest of the money the pieces of the money pig were thrown into the dust bin and the next day there stood a new money pig on the cupboard but it had not a farthing in its inside yet and therefore it could not rattle like the old one this was the beginning with him and we will make it the end of our story hans christian anderson end of chapter 99 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc chapter 100 of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggum. The Darning Needle once upon a time there was a darning needle which thought itself so fine and grand it ought to have been a sewing needle be careful it said to the fingers which held it be sure you don't let me fall for i am so thin you will never find me again that's what you think said the fingers as they closed firmly round its body look out i am followed by my train said the darning needle and a long thread came trailing behind it but the thread had no knot in it the fingers guided the needle straight toward the cook's slipper there was a little tear in the leather and it must be mended this sort of work is quite beneath me said the needle i can never do it i shall break i know i shall and break it did did not i tell you i was too slender for such a task asked the darning needle there now you are good for nothing said the fingers but they still held the needle firmly and soon they had fixed a ball of sealing wax on the top the cook now used it as a pin to fasten her scarf ho ho so i'm a scarf pin now i always knew i should make my way in the world worth always tells in the end said the needle and it chuckled to itself although you could not see it do so a darning needle never lets you see it laugh this one sat bolt upright and gazed in all directions just as if it were riding in a state carriage might i be allowed to inquire if you are made of gold it asked of its neighbor a pin you have a very bright look and a head of your own though it is ridiculously small you must do your best to grow it a bit of course it is not every one who is decorated with a ball of red sealing wax the darning needle drew itself up so proudly as it said this that it overbalanced and fell out of the scarf into the sink which the cook at the moment was rinsing down now i am going to see the world thought the needle i hope i shall not lose myself but lose itself it did and as it was washed through a long greasy pipe and carried away into the gutter it said i am not coarse and strong enough to hold my own in this world but i know who and what i am and that's a great comfort and the darning needle kept its proud bearing and did not lose its bright way of looking at things although all sorts of objects passed over it chips of wood and pieces of straw and old newspaper look how they sail it said but they little know what lies beneath them i stick fast here and there goes a chip a mere chip looking as though it was all the world and there's a straw floating by too how it whirls round and round it had better take care lest it run against a stone ah and now there is a piece of newspaper giving itself such airs too as if all that was printed on it were not forgotten long ago i have to sit still patiently and alone but i know who i am and that i shall continue still to be and that is a great comfort one day a piece of glass bottle lay beside the darning needle and because it glittered so splendidly the needle thought it must certainly be a diamond so it spoke and introduced itself good morning it said i am a scarf pin i believe i have the pleasure of speaking to a diamond yes i am a member of that family i believe was the answer and thus they both thought each other very superior 
and spoke together of the vanity and pride of the world i lived in a girl's workbox the darning needle said she was a cook and had five fingers on each hand but i never saw anything so conceited as those fingers in my life and after all is said and done they were only there to take me out and put me back into the box again were they very aristocratic then the piece of glass asked aristocratic no but very proud they were brothers all born fingers and they kept to themselves they were various heights too the first named the thumb was short and broad and held himself rather aloof from the others he only had one joint in his back so could only make one bow but he said a man could not be a soldier unless he possessed one like him on his hand the second was called sweet tooth and was used to put into sweet and sour dishes to point to the sky and the stars and make the downstrokes of the pen when the fingers wrote a letter long one was the third and could look over all the heads of the others ringold the fourth wore a gold belt round his waist and the last one of all was playboy who never did a stroke of work and was proud of it but i had to leave them said the needle they could do nothing but boast and now here we sit and glitter murmured the piece of glass but at that moment the water came rushing along the gutter and carried off the piece of glass in its arms he has received promotion already said the darning needle it is my pride that stands in my way i am so very fine and i am quite right to keep myself to myself and it sat up erect and proud and was filled with great thoughts i surely must be the child of some sunbeam it thought i am so very fine and the sunbeams always seem to me to be trying to find me beneath the water perhaps i am too slender for my mother to be able to see me i am sure if i had my old eye that was broken off i should cry but i won't it is not well bred to cry then one day some rag muffins came poking in the gutter to find farthings and old nails and other such precious things it was very muddy and dirty but they only enjoyed it the better for that ugh cried one as the darning needle ran into his fingers ugh you great ugly fellow i am a miss and not a fellow shrieked the darning needle but no one heard it the ball of sealing wax had fallen off and the needle had turned quite black but it felt more pleased with itself than ever for one looks so much slimmer in black here let us stick it into this eggshell they called and the darning needle was fixed firmly these white walls must be very becoming to me the darning needle thought i shall show up well against them and shall certainly be seen at last i hope i shall not become seasick or break but the darning needle became neither seasick nor did it break a steel stomach is a good preventative against seasickness and it did not forget that it was something better than a mere man really the finer one is the more one can bear it thought crack groaned the eggshell as the wheels of a cart passed over it gracious heavens how it presses gasped the darning needle i do believe i am going to be seasick after all i shall break but although the heavy cart rolled over it it did not break only lay stretched full length in the mud and there it may stay for there is no more of its story worth listening to hans christian anderson end of chapter one hundred recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c
Chapter 101 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggum. Master of All Masters. A girl once went to the fair to hire herself for a servant. At last a funny-looking old gentleman engaged her, and took her home to his house. When she got there he told her that he had something to teach her, for that in his house he had his own names for things. He said to her, What will you call me? Master or Mister, or whatever you please, sir, says she. He said, You must call me master of all masters. And what would you call this? Pointing to his bed. Bed or couch, or whatever you please, sir. No, that's my barnacle. And what do you call these? Said he, pointing to his pantaloons. Breeches or trousers, or whatever you please, sir. You must call them squibs and crackers. And what would you call her, pointing to the cat? Cat or kit, or whatever you please, sir. You must call her white face simony. And this now, showing the fire, what would you call this? Fire or flame, or whatever you please, sir. You must call it hot cockalorum. And what this? He went on, pointing to the water. Water or wet? Or whatever you please, sir. No, Pondalorum is its name. And what do you call all this? asked he, as he pointed to the house. House or cottage, or whatever you please, sir. You must call it High Topper Mountain. That very night the servant woke up her master in a fright, and said, Master of all masters, get out of your barnacle and put on your squibs and crackers for white-faced simony has got a spark of hot cockalorum on his tail and unless you get some pondalorum high topper mountain will be all on hot cockalorum that's all end of chapter 101 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Chapter 102 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 102. Belling the Cat. Once upon a time the mice sat in council and talked of how they might outwit their enemy, the cat. But good advice was scarce, and in vain the president called upon all the most experienced mice present to find a way. At last a very young mouse held up two fingers and asked to be allowed to speak, and as soon as he could get permission he said, I've been thinking for a long time why the cat is such a dangerous enemy. Now it's not so much because of her quickness, though people make so much fuss about that. If we could only notice her in time, I've no doubt we're nimble enough to jump into our holes before she could do us any harm. It's in her velvet paws. There's where she hides her cruel claws till she gets us in her clutches. That's where her power lies. With those paws, she can tread so lightly that we can't hear her coming. And so, while we are still dancing heedlessly about the place, she creeps close up, and before we know where we are, she pounces down on us and has us in her clutches. Well, then, it's my opinion we ought to hang a bell round her neck to warn us of her coming while there's yet time. Everyone applauded this proposal, and the council decided that it should be carried out. Now the question to be settled was, who should undertake to fasten the bell round the cat's neck? The president declared that no one could be better fitted for the task than he who had given such excellent advice. But at that the young mouse became quite confused and stammered an excuse. He was too young for the deed, he said. He didn't know the cat well enough. His grandfather, who knew her better, would be more suited to the job. 
but the grandfather declared that, just because he knew the cat very well, he would take good care not to attempt such a task. And the long and the short of it was that no other mouse would undertake the duty, and so this clever proposal was never carried out, and the cat remained mistress of the situation. End of chapter 102 Recording by Evan Smith